Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time it is for you, wherever you are right now. And welcome to another session of Bizarre Financing, how to start, buy, or expand any business with little or none of your own cash. I'm Gordon Bizarre, and today we're going to be talking about ad backs. And for those of you who have been active buying business, going to brokers or whatever it is that you're doing to identify any particular business for sale, you've probably come across this thing called ad backs. And I just want to be clear. They are the big lie to overprice the business. And what we're going to teach you today is how to argue against the ad backs and reduce the purchase price of the business, not just a little bit, often substantially. You may have questions, type them into the question or comment box on the side panel. In the alternative, you can raise your hand and ask a question. Feel free to comment live that way. I love it when people just jump on with me and actually ask the questions. It gives us a chance to dig down into that question and really develop a deeper understanding of it and a better answer as well. Please uh, feel free to raise your hand and join in. If I don't get to your question today, any unanswered questions, just send them to me in an email, question at bizarrefinancing.com. It's all it takes, and I'll answer it for you either directly or on the next webinar if it's a great question and everybody needs to have an answer to that question. First, a word or two on valuation and purchase price. It's probably the biggest single item that you're going to have to negotiate with a seller. The only other one that's as big and as important of that is frankly the terms and conditions of the purchase. Are you going to have to pay for it all in cash up front? You're going to give the seller a note. There are other things that are involved, the terms of the purchase. So that's important too. But today we're going to focus on the valuation and pricing specifically as it is addressed by Adback. There's many aspects of our program that teach you all of the other salient points about the process. But today we're going to focus on just this one. Business valuation is determined by its demonstrated ability to produce a profit. If a business has bazillion dollars worth of assets, but for the last 20 years, it hasn't made any money and it's lost money. I would suggest to you that business has no value. I don't care that it has assets. That means it's worth its liquidation price. You sell off the assets, whatever you get for them, net, that would be the value of the business. But if a business isn't making a profit, it has no value as a going business. And that's an important concept to firmly implant in your mind. One measure of profit is something called EBITDA. E-B-I-T-D-A stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Well, that's an important concept. We're going to be dealing with it a little bit today because it's a measure of the profitability and ultimately the value of the business. One valuation method, and there are many, so we're only going to talk about one valuation method today that applies an arbitrary multiple to the company's EBITDA. Okay, so that's one method. It's the method we're going to look into today. It's the most popular method, by the way, of which businesses are being priced today. So for our example, we're going to take an actual company. This is an actual case study. This is not made up numbers. These are not made up concepts. Everything you're going to see and hear today comes out of an actual business that one of our members is looking at as an acquisition and everything is as it was presented to that person. So the reason we do this is we look at real challenges that take place in the buying of a business. So the company's EBITDA was $813,289 for the year ended December 31st. That number is a very important number. It's one of the most important numbers we'll talk about in the purchase of a business. That's what they showed as their EBITDA for that company. Typically in this industry, businesses are priced at five times EBITDA. So this is typical for the industry. That's a number that comes from doing studies of the industry. The business valuation or purchase price based on this would be five times, which is the multiple, the industry multiple times the EBITDA of the business. So technically this business would be worth $4,066,000. $445. Now, nobody ever tries to price a business to the penny because it's too arbitrary and it would be too difficult to even try. So this formula gets you very much in the ballpark of the value of the business. And of course, these things are always subject to some negotiation, but I want you to have a clear picture of this particular company in the HVAC industry. They dealt in air conditioning for homes and selling and installing air conditioners. Okay. So now you got a sense of the business. You got a sense of how it would be valued. and the key thing here about this important number is if this number isn't right, okay, then the business can't be priced right. 
So you've got to have a true insight into the industry, multiple is what's common in the marketplace out there. And then the specifics of this company and its particular EBITDA. And it's important that you get this number right. All right. I want to give you a disclaimer here because it's important. This illustration that we're going to go through with you today is grossly incomplete as a method for determining the value of the business and its purchase price. Its sole purpose is to demonstrate how EBITDA and a multiplier work together in the valuation process. Now, why is this important? Because in Bizarre Financing, we teach you five different ways to price a business. We teach you how many nuances to the simple multiplication of the EBITDA times the multiple for a given industry. So please understand that we have to deal somewhat with a generalization today and that when you actually go to for real price the business, you want to be more in depth as to the nuances that would also apply. All right. Having given you that disclaimer, let's move on. The role of ad backs is an attempt by the seller to increase the valuation and thus the purchase price of the business. All right. So just keep that thought in mind. The seller will argue that many of the expenses that produce the company's EBITDA are not real operating expenses and should be added back to EBITDA for determining the purchase price, thus the term ad backs. So we're going to go through what the seller is claiming are ad backs that should be added to this all important number right here. Legitimate ad backs might be the cost of constructing a pool in the seller's backyard or paying his daughter's college tuition. So that is a legitimate ad back because it wasn't an expense of the business and therefore should be added back in to the earnings of the company because it was deducted out because it was on the company's books. It's not for the benefit of the company. It was for the personal benefit of the owner. In other words, only provable expenses that were solely for the personal benefit of the seller and are clearly additional income to the seller are justifiable ad backs because if the seller was able to really put that in his pocket or use it for what were truly personal expenses, then for the operational view of the business, that has to be added back in and nothing else. That's all that gets added back in. And yet you will see as we go through this, that the seller wants to add a whole bunch of things in to add backs that don't belong there. Valuation allocation in the sale of a business. Okay. This is an important concept here. The seller is only entitled to be paid for the business as they deliver it to you, the buyer. And what does that mean? The seller is not entitled to be paid for how they think the buyer can run the business more profitably than they did. A lot of times the seller will say to you things like, I have all these expenses, but they're unnecessary expenses. If you run the business, you'll run it more efficiently than I did. Therefore, you won't have these expenses. So we're going to add it back in because when you own it, they're not going to be expenses you're going to have. That's nonsense. And we'll show you why as we go through this. The buyer is going to assume the risks incurred due to any changes that they make. If you see something or the seller tells you, you don't have to spend this money, and then you stop spending that money when you own the business, and all of a sudden it isn't making the same amount of money, you assume that risk. Any changes you make, good or bad, they inure to you. The loss inures to you, and the buyer therefore deserves the benefits or losses that occur from such changes, okay? So if you're going to have to make changes in the business, your changes are going to be a different business than you bought. And if you make any changes, any benefit that's occurred from those changes, that belongs to you. You're incurring the risk of making those changes. If losses occur because you made those changes, that's on you. It's your responsibility. All of it is on you because everything that happens after the purchase of the business, good, bad, or ugly, belongs to you. With that as a background, okay, let's look at an actual statement of ad backs and adjustments to EBITDA submitted by the seller as an addition to the company's financial statement. So they gave us financial statements and they gave us this statement of ad backs. Now, I know you can't read this well, but I just want to show you what it looked like when they gave it to us. So this was the statement and it had all of these ad backs down the side here, all of these amounts of money, all of these amounts of money. And then he ended up with a whole new definition of EBITDA after the ad backs. Now, I'm going to move right past this because what we did is we took all those numbers and headings and I put them onto this slide so that now hopefully you can read these. And we're going to go through them very quickly first. Then we're going to take each of them one at a time. I just want you to get the concept of what was done here. Okay. So they listed all the ad backs. And in here are things like personal auto expenses, personal cell phone, self-employment tax, property taxes, vacation and holiday pay, bonuses, 
And you're going to see, again, it's just going through here, all a bunch of stuff, right? Okay. Now that you can see what they are, we're going to go back in and group them a little differently, but we're going to cover them all. Okay. And we're going to cover them all in a way that hopefully will make sense to you. And we're going to start with the personal auto expense. The seller's adding $35,000 back as an add back to their profit or their EBITDA because these are personal cars. They're not business cars. And then the next question we have to look at is for add back purposes, what counts and what does not. So the first thing you need to do is to separate what the seller is paid for their functions working in the business and what they are paid because they are the owner, okay, is different. The owner of a business who works in the business has two reasons for being compensated for the company. He works there, he manages the company, he has experience, he has expertise, he has time that he invests in the business that are payable to him based on his time and his expertise and experience. All that he's entitled to be paid for when he works there. He's an employee. And whatever he gets paid for that is not a function of ownership of the business. It's a job. And he gets paid for that job. And what he gets paid for that job does not put value on the business. What puts value on the business is the profit the business makes after it's paid him for his expertise, his time, and his experience. Okay. And then what he gets paid as an owner is all about the profit from the business. So it's important to separate that out in your mind. Only what that owner is paid because they are the owner is an ad back. What they are paid for work performed for the business is just plain old compensation. Someone must replace them. They're going to sell the business to you. So maybe the party that's going to replace them is you, or maybe this is a certain size business and you're not going to go work there. Or you're going to have to replace the seller, but you're going to place them with a professional manager or a, an executive who's going to do the work, the job that owner does in running the business. But whether it's you or somebody else, somebody has to do it. That someone's compensation is a cost of doing business and it is not profit from ownership and is not part of the business valuation. Really important concept. Okay. Now at the end of this process, we're going to look at something very specific. We're going to look at all the remaining ad backs after we've knocked out all the ones that don't belong there and offset them against the marketplace compensation required for the seller's replacement. So in other words, we're going to take all these things that the seller is saying, I earn this because I'm paid in salary. I'm earning this because I work there. I earn this because I'm the owner and there's profit in the business. I earn this because it was a personal expense for me and I paid up my personal expense. So that's clearly income to me. And when I add up all that stuff, this is what the seller pulled out of the business in the way of income, in profit, and work effort. Then we're going to add those two together, and we're going to deduct from that what it cost us to replace the seller with a paid person, including all the perks we have to give to that party. And if it's us, it's perks that our market rate entitles us to earn. All that gets deducted out of that, and it's only the net amount that we would permit to be an add back. So again, I want to make sure that you have a sense of, of that item because it's really important. Auto expense, if you hire somebody to run your company, don't you think they're going to want you to provide them with a car? In today's world, can you hire an executive that you don't pay for their car? Especially if they're going to use it even part of the time for business. You're going to have to pay for that car. The alternative is you're going to give that party mileage. You're going to pay them a dollar a mile or $2 a mile. They're going to keep a log. You're going to have expenses. Some portion of that would be an offset against deducting the full amount of auto expenses. Now, this individual had his wife working at the company, and I suspect that this amount of money could be for him alone, could be for him and his wife, could be for him, his wife, and another executive or high, higher paid person that they had at the company or a person who goes out on sales calls and therefore has to have a car in order to do that and is on the road constantly. So we don't know without a lot of investigation what's in this auto expense. But my sense of it is that no matter who this is for, it doesn't belong as an ad back because the owner of the business is going to have it just like the seller does, the new owner. So I don't normally count these things as ad backs. Other items that you saw when I showed you the uh, ad backs were vacation and holiday, bonuses, travel, meals and entertainment. Again, I'm sorry, folks. This is part of compensation. You pay holiday pay to your employees. You pay holiday pay to your executives. For higher executives, you pay vacation pay. If you're the your person who's running, the business is going to pay you vacation pay and holiday pay. Okay. And that's part of your compensation. 
bonuses. Did you do a good job this year? Then you were entitled to a bonus. Did your manager do a good job this year? They were entitled to their bonus. That's all part of your expenses of running the business. Travel. The Most of that is probably in the form of attending uh, events that, are, that deal with the business. So there's all kinds of numbers that can be in here. So we're not going to just automatically say that's an ad bag. And the same thing with meals and entertainment. Do you entertain people for sales? Do you entertain people for, uh, you entertain your employees because you want to have a meeting with them offsite. So you pay for the lunch, you pay for the dinner, but you, that way you get your people together and you're able to have a meeting. This is all kinds of stuff in there. So these are all questionable personal ad backs. And so that's a, an amount that the seller was saying is an ad back. And we're saying, no way, Jose. Okay. You got to prove all of these to me in a way that shows they have absolutely no benefit for the business and absolutely no benefit other than it was added to your personal income. And then we're going to have this process that we're going to go through down there to do a final evaluation of these things. But we're just not going to accept this as an ad back. Same argument as for personal expense for portion provided to the seller. For portion not provided to the seller, they remain as true business expenses and are not legitimate ad backs. All right. Now he had a personal cell phone on there that apparently was 5,340. Now that might've been just his cell phone. May have been a salespeople's cell phones as well. It could have been a manager's cell phone that has to be in communication with salespeople. We don't know what that is, but I can assure you that that's not going to be when we fully evaluate it, that's not going to be anything but a genuine business expense of running the business. All right. So again, we do this process here of separating what is an expense for conducting business. And we have to segregate that from what is a personal perk of ownership shown as a business expense. And that's usually done, by the way, to understate tax liability. If the item is substantially needed for functions of the business, it is not an ad back. If the item is totally unnecessary for the operation of the business and is used exclusively for the personal needs of the seller, it could be a perk of ownership unless such expense would also be required for the seller's replacement. Okay? You may be somebody who never leaves your house. The seller may be somebody who never leaves his house, but that cell phone is used constantly to interact with his company. Okay. You got to get underneath all this and determine what's what in the process. Now in there, they had a self-employment tax for $20,392. That's mostly FICA. Okay. When you're an owner operator of a business, you get hit with the FICA tax twice. You have to pay the business's side of the FICA tax as if you were an employee. And then you have to pay your personal side of the FICA tax as if you were an employee. And because you're self-employed, you get hit with both sides. So this seller is claiming that the company is an LLC, and that's how this happened. That 20000 represents the part that the business had to pay, not the part that he had to pay personally. You had to pay that personally, but the part that the business paid, they're saying that's an ad back. Why are they saying that? Because they're saying the company is an LLC, so if the new owner converts it to an S-corp, they can avoid this tax. First of all, that's nonsense. You can't avoid it by doing that number one. And number two, if this is a good idea, why hasn't the seller done it? He hasn't done it because it's not a good idea. The company is being purchased as it currently exists. If the seller believes this is a good idea, they should have converted to an S corporation themselves, proved it works, and then sell the company based on its reported earnings after they did that. But remember, they're only entitled to get paid for what they deliver to you. They're not entitled to be paid for what they're recommending you do. So this is not an ad back under any circumstances. And listen to this. The FICA cap is $9,114. So in 2022, that's the most that they could have paid in FICA tax. If the seller were correct, the difference of 11,000 between this and this number up here is guaranteed not to be correct. Okay. Because this is all that the company would have been responsible for. So where this number here came from makes no sense. Now, I'll extract a little bit of this. I don't mean to confuse you, but the seller says his wife works there too. So he may have done the same thing for his wife. So this may be his wife's business portion of FICA and his business portion of FICA. It's possible. Okay. But remember, it's all going to come back to this red statement down here at the end. Whatever these really are, when we segregate everything out, okay, it will all come out in this process here. Here we're dealing now with total real estate related ad backs. Up till now, we've been looking at them one at a time. But all of these were in different places on that ad back sheet that I showed you. But when we segregated it out, all of these are real estate related. And you're going to love this thinking process on the part of the seller or lack of thinking. 
as the case may be, which is either intentional or on purpose, but here it is. Okay. The seller is saying, look, I'm going to lease this property to the buyer because I own it. I'm going to lease it to the buyer once the deal is done. So therefore, I'll be paying the property tax. I'll be paying the interest expense. I'll be covering the depreciation. I'll be paying the property insurance. I'll be paying the facility security costs. I'll be paying repair and maintenance. And I will be paying all of this stuff, including utilities. Excuse me, that's $197,000 that he says he's been paying. So he's going to deduct it out of the company's expenses because the company isn't going to pay those expenses. But guess what the company is going to pay when he rents the building back to them? Okay, this amount will likely be higher when the buyer rents the facilities from the seller. So he's deducting all this out, showing that the business makes more money because he's going to keep up, pay these expenses personally, but yet doesn't offset this by the rent that he's going to charge for this facility, which is going to be higher than this, okay? Because he's not going to take his expenses and rent it to the company for the same thing he has to pay for it, okay? Nobody does that. So we know that this is totally bogus here. Some add backs expenses are just alternatives for expenses that will be incurred. And sometimes those expenses may be higher than the add back amount, okay? So very important that we look at this, but we're, if we look at what we've done so far, very few, if any, of these ad backs are valid ad backs so far. All right, another grouping, total employee-related ad back, uniforms for his drivers and his maintenance people and his service people. Employee screening, screening employees. Do you think these go away just because the new buyer buys the company? The uniforms have to get covered. The screening of new employees has to get covered. Recruiting and hiring is a cost that's going to continue. All of the employee-related expenses will continue after the acquisition. Any argument that the buyer does not have to continue them is bogus. There isn't any expense on there that they don't have to continue. If you look at the 11000 it's for these right here. All right, the business tax. They've added back in what they paid in a business tax of 16999 Now, what do we know about this company? What kind of company is it? It's an LLC, all right? The business is an LLC, which is a pass-through for tax purposes. The LLC pays no income tax, so this item cannot be an income tax. Any business taxes incurred by the LLC will not go away after the sale and must be paid by the buyer as a cost of doing business. So there are all kinds of business taxes that businesses pay that are not income tax, okay? And they're going to be the same for the new owner as they were for the old owner. Okay, now you have this thing called depreciation. Now, we've seen this number once before. We saw it when we looked at the real estate, but that number was like 14,000, I believe. And that was depreciation on the real estate. This is depreciation on what appears to be the equipment and would be a legitimate ad back when calculating EBITDA, okay? This is the first legitimate ad back that we came to. And why? Because remember what EBITDA is, okay? EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, okay? So the depreciation, is something that would be an ad back because it, it's deducted out when you compute EBITDA, it's deducted out from the earnings. So this is the first one that we see that's a legitimate one. Total general expenses related to ad backs. Here they are. Warehouse supplies. Are warehouse supplies going to go away because there's a new owner? Bad debt. Are there going to be some customers that don't pay the new owner? Bank services. Are the bank going to stop charging services to the new owner? Are the credit card fees that the company has to pay going to stop because there's a new owner? Whatever the service charge is, is that going to stop because there's a new owner? Merchant account fees for the credit cards that they take as a business, are they going to stop? Are they going to stop having to pay office postage? Are they going to stop paying advertising expense? Are they going to stop paying repairs and maintenance? I don't think so. Every single one of these expenses is going to go on and is a totally bogus add back. By now, I hope you have the flavor of this that you're seeing it. So here together is $24,000 worth of add back that they put in to up the income of the company to up its value, that is totally bogus. Okay, now we have total professionals that the company employs in one form or another and their related add backs. All right, legal fees. It doesn't look like they had any legal fees. What this looks like is a membership in some kind of a legal servicing group or something. I have no idea what that is, but whatever it isn't going to go away with a new owner. And the outside consulting. I don't know what the outside consulting was, but this is usually an alternative to having paid people do certain things. They have an outside agreement with another company who provides them analysis, who provides them evaluation, who provides them all forms of professional expertise, all forms of getting work done that they don't want to have full-time people to do at the company. 
So this, without a tremendous amount of explanation, is clearly not an add-on. It's going to have to be expended by the new owners because whatever caused this to be charged on the part of the old owner is likely going to cause it to be charged by the new owner. These professional expenses could continue after the acquisition and must be carefully evaluated. And even if the need is intermittent for something like this, rarely or once in a blue moon, they still are not a justifiable add back on the basis that if it isn't this, it will be something else. Businesses are notorious for having one-time expenses. But if you go back over their history, the year before they had something else that was a big one-time expense, and the year before that was a big one-time expense for something else. You can count on big one-time expenses in any substantive business. So we have all of this added in that shouldn't have been. All right, now you got this thing called vehicle leases, 74,522. They got a lot of trucks, right? They have trucks that are used in the delivery of new product, HVAC equipment that's used to go out on maintenance runs uh, for these equipment. And these are well-built trucks that are used for these purposes. They're painted and they're a billboard for the company and they serve lots of functions, but those trucks are important to the business. And this applies to business trucks and other vehicles and would be a legitimate business operating expense and not an ad back. However, a lease is just an expense, okay? So whether something is leased or whether that same asset is owned, it's going to be treated differently relative to EBITDA. But in this case, it's a lease. And so while it applies to the business trucks and other vehicles, it is a legitimate business operating expense but it is not an ad back, okay? It is not an ad back because it's a lease and a lease is just pure expense, all right? They had an item in there for charity and normally I wouldn't pay any attention to 50 bucks paid to charity, but there's a concept that I want you to get here. And so while a small number here, no matter the size, it should be considered an expense for the benefit of the company. If it was $50, $500, $5,000, $50,000, $500,000, it doesn't matter what the number is. It is an expense for the benefit of the company. And the reason that's true is that charitable donations are assumed to be a desirable business expense to improve the company's image. Why do businesses give to charities? They want the community to think they're good guys. So the new owner is going to continue this. If, if he's smart, he's maybe increase it. Maybe he's going to sponsor the, the high school baseball team or whatever he's going to do. Why? Because it puts his name in front of his marketplace customers. It's He wants the customers to think well of him and keep his company front of mind when they need air conditioning. So this is a real deal here. And it's 50 bucks that he wants to add back in as an add back. And no, we don't add it in as an add back. All right. Then he's got this other item on there. It says excess money put in the marketing fund. 15,700. Now, this item is unique to the seller. This is the first time we ever saw anything like this as an ad back. But here's what it represents. Money the seller believes is wasted in advertising expense, which, of course, you, the smart buyer, will not have to spend that wasted money. Okay? The words of the immortal William Wrigley, if you're into baseball, they got a stadium named after him, right? He's the founder of Wrigley Gum. And in the business of selling Wrigley Gum, this quote is his quote. One half the money I spend for advertising is wasted, but I have never been able to decide which half. That is the nature of advertising. All advertising has wasted aspects to it. You can't differentiate them so you don't know which ones you can't undo the ones that aren't working because usually they're mixed in and work in conjunction with the ones that do work. And so that's a nonsensical statement to have that as an ad back. They got to stay up real late at night figuring out a way to add back $15,789. Waste in advertising is a normal part of the advertising process and no part of advertising expense is a valid add back period. By now, you should have the flavor of this. And we've gone through all of the items that were there and we've shown you how and why they're not add backs. So we told the seller through the broker that, sorry, we're not going to do this. We have questions about all these add backs and we frankly do not validate any of them. Or if we do, they're a very small amount. So our buyer, that's our member here in Bizarre Financing, gets an email from the broker. And this is the email exactly worded the way we got it from the broker. So I'm going to go through with you how the broker attempts to justify the ad backs. Here's what he says, okay? The ad backs we have listed are itemized expenses that will not pass to the new owner. We already know that isn't true, right? Okay, I've attached some questions and answers we've received about them below to steer a fruitful conversation about them. We give the broker an A for diplomacy, but it's bull. And then he says, C below. To give an example, the vehicle leases, those 
vehicle assets are going to be transferred debt-free to the new owner. So we added back in those lease and note expenses, all debts will be paid off. Do we care about that? Not in terms of an add back, we don't. Okay, they're not an add back. Why? Because when we take them back, how are we going to take them? Are we going to pay for them? Yeah, we're going to have to pay money for them. How are we going to finance them if we have to pay money for them? You know what we're going to end up doing? We're going to end up leasing the vehicles. Why should we come up with all that cash to buy those vehicles? They're either going to get financed as a purchase or we're going to lease them. Either way, we're not adding that back into the ad back because we're still going to have that money going out. We're still going to have those costs. Okay, everybody get that? Okay, next thing. He says all of the expenses of the real estate will not pass to the new owner because, and then we redacted the owner's name, because the owner owns that outside of the company and will handle all expenses with that going forward. The real estate is not part of the sale. The owner won't lease to the new buyer, but all the expenses like property tax insurance, payers, utilities, will, he will handle. Yeah, but as we said, is he going to charge him rent? Yeah, he's going to charge him more rent than he's going to deduct out in all those things. So we're not going to look at this as an add back. We're going to look at this as a reduce back for the difference in the rent and what those expenses were. See how we're working here? All right, then he gets into that advertising thing. Okay, the advertising portion. They spend around 180 k plus in advertising. That is excessive. And some of it is ineffective. There is room to save 30 k there. I think we added back 17 to 18 in expenses on that 180 advertising budget. As mentioned above, we should have added back around 30K. There is plenty of room to save there, plus a lot of the revenue is generated from referrals anyway. So we've added back in a small portion of that. Does that make any sense to you based on what we just went over? No. If he's wasting money on advertising, it's up to him to figure out which one wasn't working. If he can go reduce it by that, then come back and sell the business based on the advertising after he's removed whatever the inefficiencies are so that he's selling the business based on its true performance. This is nonsense. Another point, he says, there is also a phantom employee, the wife, who takes money out of the business. I didn't even include that in the ad backs, but should have. Okay. Remember what we said earlier? Okay. Anything that the seller has taken out, money he pays to his kids, money he pays for his wife, money he pays to his grandmother, money he pays anything that is truly not involved in the business and inures to him personally and his personal efforts. We're going to track all that. Okay. But then we're going to have to offset that by what we have to pay the person who replaces his efforts and work in the business at a market rate for the caliber of the person that's required to do that job. Okay. Now, if you believe half the things that he wanted to say were unexpenses in the business, okay, what you have to conclude is this person doesn't know how to run a business. Okay. They are the worst business operator on the planet, having paid all this stuff, all that time that when you, the new buyer take over, you don't have to pay that stuff. So we're going to add it back into profit. Does that make any sense to you? Of course not. Why are merchant account fees added back? He said, merchant account fees are added back because there are free merchant accounts that can be used that have no monthly fees. They do a 2.6 to 2.9% fee per transaction, which in turn, that transaction fee should be passed on to the customer which wipes out all of these fees. And that's why we added back. Does that make any sense? I guarantee you, you start adding those fees back into your customer's bill so that they're having to pay you more than you quoted them. I have a feeling you're going to lose your customers real fast. They're not going to stand for that. So it's a great thing to do if you want to lose your business. And if that's the right way to run the business is the way you see it here, then why hasn't he been doing that all this time? He's either the worst business operator on the planet or he's trying to, I won't say what he's trying to do to you, but it's only can be done if a person just really doesn't know. So he either doesn't know or he's not a good guy. And legal fees, his legal fees won't pass to the new owner. That was like 50 bucks. I know we already explained that. Outside consulting, we already explained that too, but credit protection service, okay? Now we find out what that consulting was, credit protection service. This expense won't pass to new owners as it will be discontinued post acquisition. Wait a minute. You are spending all this money for this consultant for security or credit protection services. Are you saying that the service isn't needed going forward? Okay. This expense will not pass to new owners as it will be discontinued. How do you discontinue the expense? Was he paying it for nothing? What he was paying it to have, will that now not be inuring to the benefit of the company? Do you have income you're stating that now will not be continuing in the future because you don't have this person? Makes no sense. Now I want to know what income is the company going to lose because they're saying they're not continuing this person. And then here for bad debt, he just has bad paying customers. Like you're not going to have any of those when you own the business. It's mind blowing. Okay. Then he says, credit card fees. Tell me about this. Remember, he's telling us about the questions that they've gotten from other people. Fees from credit card processor from customers who use credit cards to pay at the time of service. 
this fee should be wiped out by charging a surcharge to the customer paying via credit card. He had another version of that before. Same thing, nonsense. Why is the business tax added back? You do add it back for EBITDA, but not for cash flow. That's the question that he got. Then correct, taxes are added back as part of the EBITDA equation. I have it itemized here to show everything we've added back, okay? Again, certain kind of business taxes are added back. Other kind of business taxes aren't. Income taxes would be added back, but it's an LLC. They shouldn't have any income tax, although so business taxes they're paying. We rightfully can assume that there are other types of business taxes. There are sales taxes. Businesses have hundreds of different taxes that they can pay that aren't income taxes, and those taxes absolutely come with the business. All right, this one I love too. You're going to love this. Uniforms. And the question was required by the franchise because it's a franchise operation. They pay a franchisor for the right to use the name and all that good stuff. Is the company reimbursed for those or is the business paying for them? All right, and here's their answer. These uniforms are rented from Syntash, not required by the franchise. No need to keep renting uniforms for the employees every year. He chooses to do that out of his own expense. This can be discontinued. All they do is pick up the uniforms, wash them, and return them clean. That's what they charge for. That's what needs to happen to them. Employees can wash their own clothes. No need to continue this expense. If you want to continue that service, there are local dry cleaners who offer the same service much cheaper. Or you could pay one of the employees a small fee to handle a service. Now, if those alternatives were as profitable for the company or more profitable for the company than the way he does it, is he a fool? Is he doing this just because he loves to watch clean, crisp uniforms working around the shop? Or is this part of the image of the company? Is this part of the reason that they look professional? Is this part of the reason that people hire them because of their appearance and the way they look? And do you think his employees are going to stand still for now having to wash their own clothes? I don't think so. He didn't do it because it would have cost him in the long run to do it. And if you tried to do it, it would cost you too. Bottom line, add up all the income payable to the seller. The income payable to the seller. His wife's pay, his pay. Anything it paid for him, if he did build a pool in his backyard, any of the things it paid for that person, then you deduct all the income items that must be paid to the seller's replacement. So whatever of that now, you got to cover for the party that's going to replace the seller, even if it's you're entitled to be compensated too. And then it's that difference that is a valid add back. And it'd be a small fraction of what you've seen here. Depreciation and interest deducted from profit and not offset by other expenses post acquisition are justifiable addbacks, but that isn't the majority of what we saw here. Nothing else is. All right, do you have any questions? I'm not seeing any questions. One thing I wanna make sure that I covered for you, and I was in here, because for some reason I don't remember it, so I'm gonna skip back here a little bit. It's this part here in yellow. The total addbacks that they claimed here were $4,354 of addbacks. The net income of the company, without all these addbacks, was only $323,934. So he's saying the net income equals that, which they show from their normal books and records, revenue minus their expenses, plus the addbacks. And then when you take and add in all of these addbacks, the addback, a third again, maybe even more than that, again, of the amount of the net income. So that when you add the $489,000 of addbacks, you come up with 813,000. Now, if you're paying five times EBITDA, for the company, and you should be paying five times EBITDA, which is really, I'm going to make this up, but it's, let's say it's 350,000 when you add in the real ad backs. And so now the five times 350, that's a big difference from paying five times P. That's nonsense. This is terrible that the seller would even try to justify this level of ad back. I've never seen anything like this in all the years I've been doing business, not at this level. And that's why this is a great example because the sellers do this stuff. And this is a pretty extreme example, but you need to have an understanding because you're going to have to argue these back if you're interested in the company. Now, here's something that I'd like you to contemplate also. When you see all of these things here, and let's say that all of this money was put in the seller's pocket, so to speak, that none of these were real business expenses. They were really their personal travel, their personal vacation, their personal bonus, their personal meals and entertainment. Okay. If these are personal, why is the company paying for these? He's falsely providing information that the government will reduce his taxes, right? So he's defrauding the government by doing this. If these are real ad backs, then he's deducting as a business expense what is a personal expense for him. That means he's dishonest. And if a person's dishonest, do you believe anything they tell you? I don't. 
So you have a real credibility problem just by the way that they did this. Trying to take his personal cell phone and saying it's a personal when it's really used for business. If it's used for business, then it's business. But he's trying to tell you it's personal. It's nonsense. He does it both ways. He defines the information in whatever way it benefits him. I think they call that narcissism. And that isn't to say you know, like narcissistic sellers, the self-employment tax, same way. All of this, and then not saying that there's a rental expenses is going to be more than that. Anyway, I think you got the picture. Let's go with a chance to ask a question here. I see two. Wow. How would add back affect your taxes? Okay, let me see if I can figure out exactly what you mean by that. It doesn't affect your tax directly because your expenses are still going to be expenses. It's just affecting the price you pay for the company. So it's going to affect how much you pay for the company. It's not going to affect your taxes. But while we're on taxes, guess what you got to worry about when you buy this company? This guy has lied to the government and he's told you he's lied to the government and he lied to the government a lot for some pretty big numbers. And it means if you go back six years, there's probably a lot of tax he didn't pay the government because he showed it as business expenses when they were personal. But guess what? There's a good chance that the government, if they ever audit you, will go back and find all this stuff. And when they do, they're going to hand you the tax bill he didn't pay. So you've got a problem even in buying this company. So what you know from this is you can't do an entity purchase. You can't buy that entity. You have to buy the asset. And that might cause you all kinds of problems in getting the franchise transferred over and all of the things that it takes to get the business into the new entity. But you leave the seller with the old entity. So if the government does ever audit and they assess a big tax, you're not involved in any of that. All you did was buy assets. You put them into a new company and you're clean of any tax liability from the seller. Okay, next question. It says, Gordon, this needs to be redigested in detail for me, at least to have questions. A lot of the information and a great example, excellent. Okay, but yeah, the reason we record these is to give you the opportunity to go over and over them again. And when we put this up on the website, what we will do is we will take all of the slides that I went over with you and we will include them in a PDF so that you can download that as well. And what that'll give you is, again, the outline as I went through it. All right. This has been great. I want to thank you for your enthusiastic presence here today. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one of these that we do.